get out And the time was now Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Sitting Down with Stand-Ups. I am your co-host, Justin Sakarica. We've got the bean behind the scene, Daryl Bean, working the cameras and the audio and all that good stuff. And once again, to my left, today is my co-host is the very lovely Elena Gonzalez. Hi, Elena, hi. how are you doing today? Pretty great. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you so much for filling in today. Yeah, love um, it, love it, love it. Yeah, again, I, it's great to know that I can count on you when I have some... Uh, some things going on, and I was also wondering maybe if you know how to perform an exorcism. Oh, are you? Oh, are you like? I, I, d I could watch a YouTube video maybe. Okay. <laughs> what's what's yeah, going on? I might need you to do that. So I uh, I recently had some unwanted renovations happen in my basement, oh, and those when. Are the worst kind. Yeah, yeah, trust me. Uh, yeah, don't be a homeowner. It costs too much fucking money. <laughs> Way too much money, but. Yeah, when I was putting my basement back together and I was putting some stuff back under the stairs, mm -hmm. I discovered written in red on one of the boards, it said sins. Like a shopping list? Like someone was, was starting their shopping list of, of sins yes. and they were going to start collecting yes. them? Or... Yeah, is that not fucking creepy that as is hell? Very, that is very creepy. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, okay. Was like... it there before? Before, and you just didn't notice it or did it happen once the wall was removed see the thing is like i don't know because like yeah. i've never gone and like hung out under my stairs i'm you know it's like the last place in my house <laughs> i want to go hang out yeah hey, i'm gonna you know hey it's fucking ving rames down here <laughs> i feel like yeah. that's the that's the the true thing to take away is people check under your stairs um get it get an inventory of any home that you purchase check under the stairs to see what is there now so then you know if it if a poltergeist put it there while you were there exactly yes or if it was if it was old how was the handwriting was it was it good handwriting it was, was it... decent handwriting but it kind of looked like a child's handwriting so that Ooh. makes it a little bit creepier i mean like obviously after we film if you want to see it yeah. you can see the sin box now if we go in there the sin box yeah I that's, feel what... Like that's what you need to name your basement yes the sin box <laughs> i mean that that's my bedroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the sim that sounds Hello, like a ladies. great name for a strip club. <laughs> Come to the cinema. <laughs> That's what you should turn the studio into. When oh you're my not God! Recording. Yes, <laughs> Conway Studios is going to become the sin box. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's creepy. Two like, for one drink specials every Tuesday. Oh yeah, <laughs> you're you're sin for the week, gluttony. <laughs> yeah, but wouldn't it be creepy if like we go under there and like a sin has been written in? Oh, like that would be creepy as shit. Like that's oh, that's when yeah. you leave and you don't come back. Okay, we are abandoning ship. We are not coming here anymore. Like what? What? Uh, I'm gonna get a little too personal, but what? What sin do you think you have? Uh, you have you have committed since you saw that 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 the poltergeist would write on there. Oh, geez, a ton. Yeah. Yes, I was making fun. If you already hit all seven. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yep. Yeah, I I was munching on cookies before uh, the podcast today. I was making fun of people who I shouldn't make fun of. Sorry, I'm an asshole. Yeah, I probably done a whole bunch of that. And um, yeah, there have been some sins that have occurred in this basement. I I have had a few bachelor parties down here. So, yeah, that's yeah. um. Yeah. Wow. Maybe that's like a manifestation of my sins. Uh huh. Yeah. That's wow. what I think is gonna happen. Yeah. We're wow. Look at that and yeah, thank God I'm going to Ohio for a few days so I don't have to deal with the creepiness here. Whatever. I, I feel like that sentence has never been spoken before. You are right. <laughs> you are right. Nobody has ever said, thank God I'm thank going God to Ohio. I'm going to Ohio. Yeah, that is not, um, that is not a sentence I ever thought I'd say. <laughs> but here I am. Yes. Here I am. Lucky I'm going to the armpit of America. So. <laughs> there, I said it. Fuck it. Who cares, right? Yes. Mm. Well, my mind is definitely... Definitely sharp today. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. I got to, oh. you know, I got to have the stupid puns. And speaking of sharp, <laughs> speaking of sharp, we have a great guest today. Um, not only is this guy a fantastic comedian, he is also one of the premier showrunners we have in the Michigan comedy scene right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the very funny and talented Greg Sharp. Greg, get on in here, man. He's also the, the city's most uh, 
foremost Marty McFly impersonator. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I, I, uh, yes. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm, I'm invested in this being a good interview. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Z, we can bring the puns. Zing. Absolutely. Yeah, there's one. <laughs> one good point made, yes. Now, now, I must ask you a question. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> oh, my God. Actually, we're going to ask you a lot of questions here today, man. But again. Oh, good. It's always nice to have a good conversation all sitting on the same side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We are all same side sitters here, yes. Like, it's a little bit like the Last Supper. We're just yeah. waiting. We're, we're like this sad couple at a, at a restaurant, like waiting for our friends right. to come. No, no, they'll be here. Yeah, they're no. they're on the way. They'll be here. Yeah. Oh my God, that's so creepy. Same side sitters. I just can't. I can't deal with that, man. No, no. In fact, if that's a good way to like end a bad date. I think. Yeah, is just go it's sit like, next to him. It's like, oh, this is going great. Let's all sit. Let's sit on the same side. Yes. It's like, you know what? I think. I think I'm gonna go. <laughs> Have you ever had that? Uh, have either of you ever gone on a date and had that person take the initiative to be a same side sitter? Oh, I don't, um, I don't think I've ever had that personally. Okay. Because that's like a that's a major red flag. It yeah. really, really, yeah. right? Like, I I mean, I've had some bad dates, but thankfully I've never had like a same side sitter because that's like okay, I'm gonna go to the bathroom <laughs> and like not come back. Yeah, that's okay. huge red flag there. Okay, I w I would agree. I thankfully have not either. I did have. Um, a guy, but he was joking, did it like after a, he went to the restroom and then came back and kind of sat down and then was like, oh, oh, he's yeah. trying to be funny. But yeah. thankfully I've never seriously had that. Yeah, because that's a cardinal sin. Oh, hey, we're talking about sins again. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's like a, a premonition or something, you know, it's like seeing into the future. The sin is same side sitting. You know what? I'm going to write that underneath there. I'm going to put same side sitting. Same side sitting. Same. Sis, 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 sis. Yes. Yeah. No, but I feel like uh, that's. I think I've had it happen where you're at a table with somebody, like mm -hmm. like two other people, and then the person on the other side leaves, yes. and now you're stuck on the same side as that other person, and then you have to like physically, it's like I'm I'm yeah. definitely not sitting next to you. Exactly. Yes. And then you have to switch. Uh -huh. I don't know. If, I don't, it's not even just a date situation. I think it's just a. Yes. Like, there's there's yeah. no way to have a good conversation. And no, it, no offense, just yeah, sitting yeah, like yeah, this. Just kind of like, yeah, yeah, the whole <laughs> time we'll just sit here and look at each other like, so, how's it going? <laughs> and even even in the, when it's when it's just off-weighted, even if it's, you know, two on one side and, and one on the other, it's still, with the two that are on one well, side, it feels like an interview. it's still awkward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what's awkward is when you can like watch a date going bad and, and like one person oh. doesn't get it. Like where like the guy is like super engaged and he's like, oh, you know, so anyway, I was playing Minecraft the other day and you're like, no, no. I saw that happen last night. Oh, God. It, uh, Scout's Honor, last night I was at a table um, and the table behind me, it was a first date situation. You could very much tell. And long periods of of silence and mm. then so <laughs> have you ever seen Dexter? Oh god, you just uh oh. and yeah. he was like, yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh are you Hulu or Netflix? Oh my yeah, goodness. That's painful. That, oh. You just get that pit in your stomach and you're like, dude, like like you almost want to go there and save one of them. Yeah. And be like, no, dude, come on. See, like, I, tag I, out. I'm, I'm different though. I, I, um, I would love watching that. I yeah. actually had something like that happen recently yeah. while I was setting up my show. Okay. So they were there the whole time while I was just setting up my stage and putting up my lights and stuff. So I got to watch the whole thing and they were like right next to where I was setting up so I got to hear almost everything. And it was so awful that I loved every minute of it. It was <laughs> so great. Like I got to see beginning and middle end, and then they left together with like, like they had both decided before they even got there. It didn't matter how bad the date was. They were going home together. Oh, they were okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And it was like, man, there was nothing this guy could say <laughs> that was going to talk her out of it. <laughs> was was it definitely stronger one or the other? Like, was the guy terrible? Uh, and the girl was putting up with it, or they were just both. A it bad was match. clear that she was not what he expected. Oh, okay. And like he was putting in zero effort. Oh, okay. And that, but still, by the end of it, she was like, "Yeah, we're we're gonna go back to my place after this," and we had already decided that that was gonna happen. And it didn't matter how bad the conversation was, and I got to listen to the whole thing, and it was magnificent. And, <laughs> and where? Where was this taking place at? Oh, this was at uh, the Beer Grotto in Dexter, which is where I do my show. Oh. 
Oh. Uh, every Tuesday night. Yeah, How was, long uh, have you been doing that show? Uh, se uh, 64 weeks. 64 weeks. So, yeah. Jeez. We you, just had you're 64. You're like the so. worst toddler parent. I know. Yeah. I'm just like counting 64, weeks. 64. Yeah. Is this what? Yeah. So no, it's a, we're going on a, a good almost a year and a half. So That's great. Nice work, man. I know. Uh, every Tuesday, we only missed one. Had a power outage that day. It wasn't oh, my fault. But fucking electricity. I know. I know. It was, uh, it's going great. It's always, been, it's always been good there. Yeah. Now, so like with you being a, like a, a fellow booker, booking is what I love to do in the comedy scene. Like Booking is my favorite thing to do. Like, at what point did you decide that you wanted to start booking your own shows? Uh, well, it was, it's, it's probably like the same way a lot of people end up doing it is because you want to get booked on shows and I wanted to have a show that I was always booked on mm -hmm. and doing a weekly show it works out perfect where I can go up and do new material every week as like my, my built-in open mic for myself um, so that was really the the real reason to do it is to give myself an opportunity to really you know buckle down and, and work on my stuff but at the same time like I've spent the last few years really studying the scene around here and I know that we have a lot of talent so I wanted to do a show that really showcased how good we are as a scene. Mm -hmm. And I, I really get the opportunity to do that every week because we get to put up seven or eight amazing comics every week with very few repeats mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. like a two-month span. Yeah. And it's really incredible. And, and the, the support we've had from the people that have come to the shows shows that people really do appreciate. that It's not just an open mic, mm -hmm. even though we don't charge admission to get in. Um, we're actually doing something like a real show, like a real showcase of, mm -hmm. of what we're capable of doing here. And on a Tuesday night, it's just, it's the absolute yeah. best opportunity for a comedian to and, go to. And you've been doing this, you said, uh, but a year and a half, which puts us where in the, the COVID, you know, world, how was that kind of navigating the, the first wave of, okay, we're kind of back in the real world, but we're kind of not, but we're going to do a show. How did that all uh, Going back to, up? like, once everything opened up, mm -hmm. uh, the show has been, like, basically nonstop. And it, it, I don't know how we would have navigated around that before then, but mm -hmm. we haven't had any issues with that. It was, it was after nice. everything was all, all open again. And really, since day one, it's been, you know, we've had, we've had some good standing room only shows there. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the time, it's most of the tables are, have people at them. So, mm -hmm. well, people need a good laugh. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, now, Especially out in Dexter, where there's not a whole lot. I mean, we're yeah. sort of like out in the middle of nowhere. There's not a whole lot of stuff to do out there. So, even going to a movie is a 25 minute drive. Yeah. So, how did you get? Um, how did you pick uh, Beer Grotto? Like, how did that it's, it's actually come the up? place that I hang out the most. So, like, I knew the owner, I knew the the people who ran the bar, and I knew I knew all the staff there uh, for years. So it was just my first choice. It was it was an obvious choice, and they did they made some structural changes to the to the venue that made doing a show like I do possible. It used to be split down the middle, okay. And there just wouldn't have been enough room to do a show the size of what we do there. And once they opened everything up, it was perfect. That's so we great. just put the stage off in the corner, and when the show starts, the lights come down, and the bar tells everybody to shut the fuck up, <laughs> and and we just uh, it's it's been really great because it's actually we get to do like an actual comedy show. It's not like going into a bar where you're fighting with the TVs, yeah. you're fighting with people. Turn playing the pool. fucking game back on. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a real show that uh, even though we don't charge admission, we don't sell tickets. The sh the the bar treats it as if we, it's a private event. And that's a huge help when the actual venue and the people that work there are, are like really on board. And I've gotten like real lucky with the venues I do shows at because they are so on board about, mm -hmm. you know, having the shows. And I'm like, this is a huge help because it helps with marketing and like they get enthused about it. And again, like you said, it's great that the, that the people at the Beer Grotto are enthused about the shows that you put on there because yeah. I'm sure it brings them a lot of business. It, it absolutely does. I mean, you can look at the, the Google stats as to when it's busy at the Beer Grotto. Tuesday is like a weekend, a weekend night there, That's great. which is crazy. <laughs> um, but I also set those expectations up ahead of time very early with them, sort of telling them what I'd like to do. I'd like to play like intro music and sort of like make it like an actual experience uh, and tell everybody that the show is about to begin and give announcements that it, you know, if, yeah. you're gonna, if you're going to have a conversation, you should take it outside. So I told the bar that I was going to do that ahead of time and they've all been supportive. Um, but I think setting those expectations up front uh, helped me sort of establish that. Like once we went along, like, oh, can you turn that TV off? Because mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the show's starting yeah. and, and they've been very supportive because I told them what I was going to do. Right. 
Is there something that you have learned in the last year and a half that you wish you could tell pre-show Greg? Uh, pre-show Greg? I don't know that I, I would... I feel like I'm always trying to make the show better anyways. Mm -hmm. So all of the lessons I'm learning as I go just sort of like go into whatever I'm going to do next week. Um, do I know more than I did 63 weeks ago? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, personally, I had no idea that what to expect once mm -hmm. we started. Um, but the support from the, the bar has been great. The support from the patrons have been great. But the support from the comedians is unbelievable. I think, I think what I would tell uh, Greg back then is it's basically what I've learned all along is when you treat the comedians right, they come out there and they want to put on a good show too. It's, they're not going to treat it like an open mic. They're not going to come out there and do uh, their unworked material yeah. mm -hmm. um, because they want it to be a good show. They're treating it like a weekend show. So, right. um, and I, I think it comes down to like the first principles of why I do what I do, which is just treat people well and then good things happen. And we've done that. We've, we've been able to uh, treat the comedians well. Everybody gets paid every show. Um, out of our tip bucket, which is unbelievable, mm -hmm. um, and we've been able to be very generous with the comedians, and I think comedians appreciate that coming out to a show on a Tuesday night and actually getting paid. For right. Well, yeah, for I mean, if, right. if the the show wouldn't have lasted sixty four weeks if the comedians didn't appreciate it. You know, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So you're you're clearly doing something right. And by the way, I think you do have an opportunity to go back and tell. Uh, Greg from 64 weeks ago, especially wearing that Martin McFly vest, you know, <laughs> just hop in your DeLorean when you leave here and, and go back and you can, you know, work out any early kinks. Now, I got to ask you, man, how nervous were you the first show that you did there? Um, I don't know that nervous ever really like enters into my, my frame of mind. I always want something to be great. Whatever I do, um, like even like the moment I knew I had that show, it was like, okay, how do I make this show stand out? And I think uh, doing the things that we do, is, especially in regards to, like, collecting tips, and um, we've evolved that over time so that people can even, like, they don't bring cash to the show, they can donate through Venmo, and we've been able to set that all mm -hmm. up. Um, so whatever, whenever, whenever I throw myself into something, I always want it to be, like, the best possible thing. And, and that goes back to, like, I used to announce uh, Little League games. I would be, like, the, the PA announcer yeah. for announcing little kids' names before they come up to bat at a Little League game, which sounds really stupid. It's, it's, sounds, not, I, it, it's not, it's not a, a, a big thing that a, a lot of people would put a lot of effort into, but I knew that if I put a little bit of effort into that, it would make that kid's day. Mm -hmm. So I used a lot, of, a lot of that same sort of mentality. is like, what can make all of this better? Mm -hmm. And I think treating it like a real show, uh, doing the, the announcements up front, bringing the lights down, making everybody turn and look at the stage, does a lot to... Uh, set their expectations mm -hmm. on what they're about to get, and I've sort of I've observed a lot of that. Like once once people come into the show, like even like people who have come for the first time and they sit down and they're like, I don't know what to expect here. It could be an open mic, and once they realize what it actually is, mm -hmm. I see a lot of that uh, that connection. Is like, oh, this is a real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to get my wallet out because this is yeah. something that I want to support. So, um, and I think it's just it all comes back to just trying to make. Make it something real. Make it something that people appreciate as being a real thing and not just something that we're just making up as we go. Mm -hmm. How did you land on the comedy experiment? As the name? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really, I don't know if there's a, a good uh, ex explanation for that, but the experiment is, uh, that this is all, that's all comedy is. It's just an experiment. We're just mm -hmm. all practicing for our next show. It doesn't matter if you're doing an open mic at New Way or if you're doing the comedy experiment out in Dexter or if you're doing the Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. All of your sets are preparing you for the next set. You're going to learn something about the way that the audience responded or something that you said or a word that you used that you didn't use before that you're going to you're going to learn from that and you're going to take it into the next experiment. So it's 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 part of the whole experimentation of what comedy is. And I think we're just always constantly learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Constantly evolving and, you know, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. You know? And speaking of that, like, have you, like, what is one thing that you've discovered about your room that is, like, one thing that maybe you won't ever do again? Because I know I've experimented a few times trying to, to do certain things in my rooms, and I'm like, eh, maybe that wasn't a really good idea. Like, anything, like, maybe any pointers to any other bookers out there that... Uh, I don't know that if I have a... I don't know if I would put it like necessarily like what you put it or how you put it, um, but there's always something to be learned about the people that you put in the positions uh, that you put them there. Like uh, your show 
sort of rides on the ability of your host to keep people engaged in what's going on. And, you know, not everybody has the ability to host a mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. And part of what I've had to learn is, like, what makes a good host? What mm -hmm. makes somebody... Uh, I think a lot of us as comedians look at the MC as being like, oh, I don't want to be just the MC. I want to be a feature. I want to be a headliner. Mm -hmm. But I think something that all of us need to learn as comedians is that being an MC is an invaluable asset oh, yeah. in your uh, in your toolbox because it teaches you how to uh, keep the audience engaged even when you're doing a feature set. Mm -hmm. And not everybody has those skills. And... I don't know if my show is the opportunity that I would give somebody to like try it out because I, I, I want to, I want to give people opportunities, right? but I've noticed the difference between somebody who's very skilled at hosting and somebody who's just learning how to host right. and it makes or breaks a good show. It really does. Yeah. And, and, and hosting is something like it, not saying that every comedian has the same career goals or career path, but if you look at some of the fame that comes with comedian, if you look at it like a career path, you go MC, feature, headliner, and then you go to Hollywood, every job is back to MC. Exactly. If you're gonna be a host on a show, if you're gonna be even just a panelist on a show, it, it all goes back to being a good I mean, what MC. Is, what is Jimmy Fallon? He's just an, an MC. MC. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. Just keep it moving. Just keep it moving. Get the energy going. You know, every Let everybody know they're all there to have a every, good time. Yeah, and exactly. It's, exactly. I've, I've uh, sort of, I've called myself sort of like the, the cruise director of the show. Yes. Right? Like, what is the yeah. cruise director's job? It's just yes. like, yo, we're all going to have a good time. We're uh -huh. all going to mm -hmm. keep it upbeat. And yep. that's, your, that's your job as a host. No matter how badly I bomb every week. Yep. I have to put on the happy face mm -hmm. and let exactly. everybody know that we're still going to have a great show no matter how much they hated me. Because that's that's what you're building more so than um, more so than whomever's face is on the poster or whoever's name is on the poster. When you are creating that weekly show as the cruise director, Susie from Dexter, who comes every Tuesday, knows you and trusts you and that's all that it is is that you and and that i won't say you that the comedy experiment is a good time and that it is a trustworthy name right. and that right. there you and go and i think you're touching on something really important about what stand up comedy is to a lot of people who haven't mm -hmm. experienced it up close to a lot of people it's picking on the person in the front row or watching somebody do crowd work and then right. they're just making fun of people or whatever. And a lot of people have anxiety walking into a show like, I don't want to sit up front. I don't want to be the center of attention. Yeah. I'm not here for that. Mm -hmm. And I think we lose sight of that as comedians a lot because we all just want to be on our feet and <laughs> making whatever yeah. joke we possibly can. But when we reinforce those uh, insecurities that people already have coming into the show, those people probably aren't coming back. Right. And right. Uh, part of my job as a showrunner is to make sure that they want to come back. Mm-hmm. Also, my job as a showrunner is to make sure that the comedian is being supported, being as funny as they want to be, while also sort of like towing that line. Right. And are there comedians who are not good at sort of managing their expectations of what they need? There's absolutely oh, yeah. very funny comedians who probably are having trouble getting booked right now because showrunners look at them as being kind of like a wild card. Right. Yes. And right. my job is... I, I don't want to get fired by the bar. I want to yep. make sure that my show can still happen next week. And if the difference between keeping my show and losing my show is inviting somebody in who might be hilarious, but also is known to go over that line. Right. Yes. Uh, I'm not willing to take that risk. I've got too many other things I have to think about. I want to support the comedians that do my show. I want to support the, the bar. Yep. And I will tell you right now, as a booker, the easiest way to not get booked on my show is to brag to me about how many people you walked at a show. <laughs> Just letting you know. Isn't that amazing? Like, yeah. Like, why isn't that common sense? Yeah, like, they're like, oh, oh so, man, like, a, uh, like two tables left. I'm like, not nah, on my show. The, why, so, why are you telling me this? Hint, hint, <laughs> if you ever brag to me about how many people you walked on a show and you aren't getting on my show, Take a minute to realize it. There's <laughs> money involved, and again, reputation. So please, I'm not. Yes. I'm not naive to the uh, to the thinking that leads those people to brag about that. I, yeah, yeah. I, I understand yeah, yeah. what they're trying to get at, but it's a business. We're trying yes. to do something that 
we can do so, uh, no audience, I'm trying to no make show. a living out of ex- yeah. no audience, no show yes. is exactly right. So, um, like I understand like wanting to be like the like live on the edge. I know that's where a lot of the funniest things happen. But edge lord comedy is not going to fill a room every week because exactly. the people who first of all are willing to spend their money on a ticket to go to a comedy right, show right. aren't looking to go get made fun of. They're not looking to sort of like live on edge or yeah. like kind of worry about if the person I'm coming with is going to be offended by something that's said. Like, I think, I think a lot of us are, uh, we lose sight of that also, is if I'm sitting next to somebody at a show who I know has sensibilities about a certain topic and then the comedian talks about that topic... I'm not going to laugh about it right away until I know that it's okay right, with the person yeah. next to me. And, right. and I see that happen a lot where uh, like people are sort of like a little uptight about laughing about something because they don't know if the company mm-hmm. that they're keeping is okay with them laughing at that also. Yes. Um, so, I mean, that's something that the edgelord comedians, just, yeah. I don't know if they get it and or it, if they know, don't like, want there's, to. There's a very big difference between towing the line and then just making a straight up shocking statement cuz i mean that i i've always been under the the um the mindset of hey say what you want to say but you are going to have to face the consequences of what you say mm-hmm. so that's one i mean hey you know what if you say something crazy and people don't want to book you guess what that's on you yeah. that's on you and you have to know where to toe the line again mm-hmm. i am all about hey you know what i'm not going to censor anybody but you have to live with Mm-hmm. What you say, right, basically, right. and you know, use your best mindset. Okay, like don't yep. you know, don't say stuff to be shocking and hope that a few people find it funny. Yep, and you know? there is also, uh, uh, without sounding demeaning or degrading, but is is understanding. This, I can't think of another way to phrase it, so I'm, I apologize in advance. But knowing your place, meaning where you're at in your career, in your city, in your state, wherever you are, if you are at a local establishment on a Tuesday night as a nameless person on a lineup, that is not the same as being Jimmy Carr, or I'm trying to think of other, like, or Anthony Jeselnik. Exactly. Who is known for being X, Y, Z, and that's right. what people are understanding. Mm-hmm. So there is a balance of, well, how am I going to get time to get better or whatever? But it is knowing where you're at in your progression and also understanding your actual skill set. And I use Jimmy Carr because he is very sharp sharp <laughs> and very shocking but he is also very in tune with if there is ever a joke and he said something similar i'm sorry if i'm paraphrasing but if there's ever a joke where i feel myself looking around the room or if i have a joke about a disability and i look out in the audience and there's a quadriplegic and i don't do the joke i can never do that joke again right Because that means it's not funny enough. Right. And I think you're touching on something really important, which is the skill set required to pull off Mm -hmm. a hard joke. Yes. And there's a lot of comedians in our scene that are very capable of pulling off a hard joke. Yes. So, Uh and a lot of them have done my show and will do it again. Mm -hmm. So it's not about uh, censoring the the joke that might be offensive to somebody. Right. It's about the skill set required to pull it off. You mentioned two comedians that are very skilled at being able to pull off saying almost anything. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have as much to do with their reputation of saying such things. It has more to do with their ability to do it in a way that makes you understand that they are in on the joke. Yes. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. not all comedians are aware of that yeah. difference. It yes. comes off as a joke and not an insult. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so that, there's a very, again, there's a very fine line between... <laughs> Just a bl- like a blatant insulting comment or a joke, mm-hmm. and again you have to know and you have to have those skills to be able to tell something like that. Yeah, and it's something that we all learn as comedians. We mm-hmm. all sort of have to find out like, oh, they that got the bad reaction. Yes. I yeah. need to learn the lesson. Oh, I mean, of that. we've all we've all had that before, where it's like, oh, when you're like, oh shit, like, okay, moving on, yeah. you know, yeah. and you go back and you say, okay, what could I have changed? Like, what did I do in that? in that time that just fucked that whole thing up. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think if you're not making those sort of self-reflective uh, 
if you're not taking time to reflect on yes. what it was that got yeah. that reaction, then you're not really doing the work that is required. Agreed. I mean, I have I have jokes in my act that I've had to work out to make them just right, and some people might still find them offensive. But, and it's going to happen. But you it, know, it's, 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 it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Mean, but I'm still proud of the way that I've written the jokes that I've written, and. It's just something that I'll still continually learn how to make yeah, those types of things better. Because all of us want to say something that's never been said before. Yes. Mm-hmm. And yes. when we live in a society where things are not allowed to be said, there's a lot of things that haven't been said before. Yeah. So that's part of our job as comedians is to be the jesters. Say the things that can't be said. Um, but it's also our job to know how they can be said make it so smart that they can reach the whole audience. Yeah, like make yeah. it smart. Again, just don't be a blatant, you know, like... Again, I've said it a million times, I believe that you should be able to say what you want to say, but just be warned that if you don't say it in the right way, yeah, yeah. people are going to be coming for you. So <laughs> make it smart, make it tasteful, and if there is no way to make it smart or tasteful, well, maybe you shouldn't be saying it. Yeah, yeah and yeah. there's a, you know, all of that, it's it's a very easy for us to slide into cancel culture and, and all of that stuff, but if you look at those that have made it over the years, and in my opinion, I think Carlin is the perfect example. Over the decades that he was performing, life was way different from the 1950s to the 1990s as far as what society would accept as as culturally appropriate or what they would even entertain with their wallet in that time. But he was able to... It basically comes down to be able to read the fucking room and that's what he was able to do yeah. mm-hmm. and and it, people will will argue you know that his opinions changed or whatever but ultimately he was able to read the room every step of the way and that's why he's always kind of at the top yeah. and that is a skill that mm-hmm. you have to learn it I, takes a long time i have had to make sort of like not not apologize for mm-hmm. a comedian that's been up, but at my show, I've had to go up on stage following a comedian that didn't get the response that they'd hoped for, mm-hmm. and say, "Look, uh, we understand that you know sometimes they don't land. We're all just trying to make people laugh. Mm-hmm. That's right. really all of us right. are trying to yeah. do. It's not our intention to try and hurt people's feelings. Sometimes we miss the mark. We're all just trying to be better. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the experiment. It, yeah, that's it, part it, of the exactly, experiment, yeah. right? Yeah. Like it." it I said it's not an open mic, but it's still a bar show on a Tuesday in the yeah. middle of nowhere. Right. So you're not going to get Jimmy Carr. You're not going to get right. Uh, right. Bill Burr. It doesn't. It. I, I think when you set those expectations, there's a lot of forgiveness that comes along with that, as long as you're willing to have the conversation too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, um, one thing I wanted to ask you is, what has been your biggest like oh shit moment as a booker like like any like super last minute cancellations or like you mentioned that you had a power outage the one time there like i mean that that happens i mean there's nothing you can really do about a late minute cancellation uh i'm fortunate that out in dexter we're close to ann arbor so i have i have a list of uh comedians that i reach out right away if i have if i have to fill in something on short notice and i've almost never had the problem of not being able to fill a spot that's great um and whenever you can't fill a spot there's obviously another comedian on the lineup that's more than, more than willing to do a little bit more yeah. time to fill up the space. But yeah. if there's anything that I've been accused of uh, with my show, it's that I run too long, which I do. It's an hour and 40 minutes on the short end. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I never worry about anything like that. Um, as far as any other oh shit moments, I mean, you just you just roll with whatever mm-hmm. comes to you. Um, we've had to deal with some uh, some unruly customers mm-hmm. uh we've had to ask people to leave and we've, we've had the support of the bar to do that um i think that comes with the territory mm-hmm. uh I, you go to any any club it's not going to be a perfectly right. yeah there's show always right. there's time. always going to be something that um, pops up yeah. there's always something you just have and i think that's part of what comedy is is just being able to adjust to whatever situations mm-hmm. arise mm-hmm. um like i'm not a good crowd work comedian i'd like to be but uh, doing my own show is helping me sort of like expand on that a little bit. Um, but it's not, it's never going to be the type of comedian I am. I like writing, writing jokes and telling jokes. Um, I forget what I was going with this, but, <laughs> but no, it's like, uh, learning how to, uh, communicate with the audience in real time is something that we should all be learning anyways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if somebody blurts something out during a show, that's fine. I can roll with that. Uh, if it becomes an issue, then we'll, Tell them to get the fuck out, but yeah. um, we haven't had we haven't had too many 
uh, horrific things happen during that's the show. That's fortunate. Been, we've been we've been really uh, we've been really fortunate because everything has been uh, mostly positive. Well, I think a positive show attracts positive audience members right. and positive comedians. Yeah. Again, when you take the time to build a show the right way, usually it's going to be a great show no matter what, you know. And you know, again, I've had the I've only had to ask somebody to leave one time. And it was a whole big thing because it ended up being the bar manager's sister's table. <laughs> and I called her and I'm like, what do I do? Because your sister's causing problems right now. Like, mm -hmm. like I need her to leave. Yeah. I need her to leave. Yeah. And like, what the fuck is happening right now? And yeah, that was a mess. But, it, you know, it all worked yeah. out in the end. So I think what something you said about just doing a positive show, mm -hmm. right? Like if you let if you set the expectation that we're just here to laugh, it sort of like lets everybody in on what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, you're always going to have, like, assholes that show up to a bar or a, yeah. any kind of show, mm -hmm. and they just want to be the center of attention. There's not a whole lot you can do about that. Right. But, but I mean, the, the reason I do my show is, is all centered around something very positive. Uh, I deal with depression, so I hand out bracelets that say, I'm glad you're here. So I get to say that every single show up top. This is why we do what we do, so that I can tell everybody that I'm glad they're here every week. And that sort of lets everybody know that, okay, this isn't, nobody's out here to hurt anybody's feelings. We're not trying to, uh, we're not trying to accomplish anything other than make people laugh. Mm -hmm. Which is, as comedians, that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, and, you know, there's, there's times that we lose sight of that, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but as long as we can, you know, keep focused on the real reasons we're doing what we're doing, that makes it a lot more fun. It makes it a lot easier to drive two hours to, to do five minutes when you realize that there's actually good that can come from it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked a lot about um, your your show and being a booker and everything, but you are a, a working, driving two-hour comedian. Um, and I uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, North Carolina specifically. Oh, North Carolina was fantastic. Yeah. I did the North Carolina Comedy Festival uh, last, last month in September, uh, and it was like the best experience that I could... I could have ever imagined out of a comedy festival. Like, I had no idea really what to expect. I've heard sort of the horror stories about how some festivals are just sort of money grabs, and then you get mm -hmm. there, and you do your, your set, and nobody even acknowledges that you were there, and then yeah. you go home, and you think, what did I spend all that money on? Right. Because like, doing a festival, you're traveling, you're, you know, at least the one I did, I was, in, I, was in, I was paying for my own travel, paying for my own lodging. So I had to really make it worth it. I, yeah. I really hoped that it would be worth it to do it. And when I got there, it was just one of the best experiences I've ever had in comedy. Because it was five days of just comedians hanging out together. That's great. Just having conversations just like this. Um, and obviously we did shows also in the evenings. But like we met for lunches. We did dinners together. And the club that put it all together, uh, the Idiot Box in Greensboro, uh, is just a, a fantastic a uh, little club. It's just like a, a little hundred seat theater, mm -hmm. and uh, just they they just do it right there. And they have a little bar that's right next door that's also owned by the the, the club. And between there was picnic tables where we could all hang out oh, and that's chill. Nice. And the weather was really great all week, so we got to do all that. And I met some really great people. Uh, I made some good contacts all over the country now. So I've already started booking shows because of doing the festival. Oh yeah, nice. so um, I. I I can't speak to the, the quality of other festivals, but certainly the North Carolina Comedy Festival really blew me away. Nice. Yeah, I know. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Nope, you go. I know there was a, there was a comedian who uh, was up here a little bit over the su uh, summer, Devin Roberts. I don't know if you guys had a chance to meet her, but she was from North Carolina, I believe. And if you're not from North Carolina, Devin, I'm sorry, I forgot, but <laughs> she was really talking up where she was from, but I'm pretty sure that it was North Carolina. So that, you know, it definitely rings true that the scene there seems to be as good as the scene here. And it is it is very cool to go to other states or even other countries and see how their scenes are compared to the scene here. Yeah, I think uh, in Michigan, we're, I don't know what makes us, there's a lot of things that make us special, but one of the things it really does is that we're all spread out. Like, we're not all centrally located in Brooklyn mm -hmm. where we're all just fighting over the same mics all within, I don't know, mm -hmm. I've never been to Brooklyn, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, these are all assumptions. Uh -huh. uh, but in Michigan, like we have to go to Grand Rapids, Traverse City, Detroit, Ann Arbor, Lansing. We have all these like little scenes that are all, that all make up the larger mm -hmm. scene. And I think North Carolina was a lot like that with Greensboro and Charlotte. And they all had, all, they all had their separate scenes. Um, and a lot of them knew each other. A lot of them had seen each other just because they drive around and do all the yeah. same mics. But 
But I think when you live in a place as like like Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, I think we're very fortunate to have the scene that we do because we get different perspectives, even from like Toledo or yes. yeah. Cleveland. Like we we are in a, a weird little sort of eight like nexus of the universe here where uh, we get to experience comedy. F like they want to come here for some reason. Mm -hmm. It's really yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've always said I really believe that Michigan has enough talent to be like the place to go. I mean, I know a lot of people want to go out to L.A., they want to go to Texas. I'm telling you right now, if you're watching this and you're from another, another state, Michigan is the place to be. And like you said, there are a ton of little micro scenes. Like, you get a little bit of different comedians from Grand Rapids or Lansing, Ann Arbor, Detroit. You know, it's very cool to kind of go to each of those cities and see how the scene is a little bit different, but it still has that, you know, really welcoming vibe right. to it. And I think uh, as part of that comes with, like, if you just, like, land in one of those smaller scenes, like Ann Arbor or Lansing, you could be a standout if you have any talent in a smaller scene like that while still making a name for yourself in, in the middle of the larger scene, which is Michigan. Whereas I think you might have a little bit more trouble going somewhere like Austin or L.A. or New York or Chicago, trying to make a name for yourself or trying to get noticed where everybody's sort of like all in one place. Right, right. Yeah, now, uh, one thing I'm going to put you on the spot right now, and don't answer if you don't want oh, okay. to, which little micro scene's been your favorite so far? Oh, I don't know if I could pick a favorite, but I get to observe all of them. I, I consider myself part of the Ann Arbor scene, um, which is mostly made up of uh, much younger comedians than me. So I don't, know if they would consider, I don't know if they would consider me part of the Ann Arbor scene because I'm probably twice as old as a lot of those mm -hmm. comedians out there. Um, but I love that little scene because it's supported by that nice little club in Ann Arbor, the Ann Arbor mm -hmm. Comedy Showcase. And the club does a really good job of allowing those younger comedians to sort of like build their acts up and, and they, they give them a lot of opportunities there. Um, but all of the little scenes have their own unique flavor to them. Like Lansing is very weird. <laughs> uh, Ham Hamtramck is very independent. It's got it like uh -huh. ha Hamtramck is almost a separate scene from the Detroit scene. Agreed. Um, yes. And then the Ferndale uh, Royal Oak scene is I, I I think I would consider them almost like the mainstream Michigan scene because everybody sort of wants to mm -hmm. get to the mm -hmm. castle. I think that's part of the mindset out there. Right. Um, but then Grand Rapids is totally different from everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's I get to observe all of it because we get uh, comedians from all over the state uh, at the comedy experiment and. I, I I enjoy watching the other scenes sort of commingle because we can all be a little bit clicky. Oh yeah, yeah. oh I mean, and, of course. Yeah, and there's always a good little bit of like like f like friendly rivalry. Yeah, a little bit going mm -hmm. on. Which again, rivalry is a good thing, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it's good that we keep it friendly. And by the way, if you are an Ann Arbor comedian watching, let us know if you think he is part of the scene. <laughs> let us know and be like, yes, we're for Greg Sharper. No, fuck that guy. He's definitely part of our scene. <laughs> sorry, and Andrew has voted you off the island. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. So I, I am, I am taking a leap here because I'm not sure if you are actually this guy, but I, I feel like you might be the type of guy that would look at maybe vision boards or goal lists <laughs> or or anything um, along those lines. And so I'm going to hit you with, uh, with 2023 is right around the corner. And you don't have to give the, the all intensive, you know, super long list, but what is... What is one thing that you're looking at on your on your comedy vision board for 2023? I, I oh, uh, I'll, I'll sort of break it down to it. Uh, thank you for recognizing that I am indeed a vision board yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of guy. Mm -hmm. In fact, before the show, we were talking about how I'm trying to manifest a friend with a boat. So if you <laughs> know anybody with a boat, I would love to be your friend. Um, but no, I, uh, I I do have some like personal goals in comedy okay. uh, that I'm working towards. I would love to be a road comic working 40 weekends a year. That's my goal. That's the okay. one that I've written down. That's three weekends a month, uh, three or four weekends a month. Uh, and I feel like that is the kind of life that I would love to have. I love hotels. I love being on the road. I love traveling. Um, I'd love to be uh, a feature within a couple of years. I've been doing some feature work, mm -hmm. um, but haven't been like getting booked at clubs yet. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I love that. That's the short term goal. But long term is I'd like to make it a career. I'd like to be a, a real working comedian that gets booked at, at clubs almost every month, every week. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the show is concerned, um, the show is evolving as it always is. And I think for 2023, you'll see some really exciting changes that I'm not going to talk about yet. But, oh, but, uh, mysterious. No, I, I, know, I, know, I, I don't know what it's going to be yet because um, uh, I'm really proud of what we've been able to do there. 
uh, with the show as it is. But I'd like to do more ticketed shows. We, mm -hmm. we, uh, we did one ticketed show this year. We did the uh, Brett Hayden album recording, oh, which yes. was just an unbelievable experience. Mm -hmm. So I want to do more shows like that. I want to be able to give uh, opportunities to like larger name comedians to come into a small venue like, mm -hmm. the, like the Beer Grotto or elsewhere. Um, I'd like to start doing private events with, uh, with the comedy experiment also. So nice. who knows where we're going with that. Um, but I think 2023 is going to be pretty big. That's would exciting. you would you dare say that where you're going, you don't need roads? <laughs> Again, I'm sorry. I got to keep doing the back to the stupid <laughs> jokes right now. That was too. That was too perfect. Oh, can we can we at least mention that tomorrow is Halloween when we're recording this show? I don't know. <laughs> so I was. So we can do it. Yeah. 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 So, this is no. It, it's not October 30th. It, it, it's April 4th right now. No, right. Sorry. No. no I, I, I am not wearing a costume, but I will say I, I'm, I'm the, the mustache is new. <laughs> I shaved off the beard yesterday because I I went to a Halloween party and I was I was Ted Lasso. I have the whole Ted Lasso mm -hmm. uh, costume, and somebody came up to me at the party and said, "Are you Ron Swanson?" <laughs> Oh, like, in uh, your costume? In my in my Ted Lasso costume. Oh, and I wow. said, no, I'm Ted Lasso. But then I was like, okay, I can double dip on this mustache idea. So yeah. maybe I'm a, I'm a little bit Ron swanson -y today. Maybe a red polo would have been better. But oh, You just need a lot more eggs and bacon. Eggs that's, yes. that's all, that's all, all of the all eggs, eggs and, and bacon. bacon. And I've only yes. got three eggs in the fridge right now. So <laughs> not, not nearly enough. Now, are you are you gonna do no shave November? Are you gonna take that thing off tomorrow? Uh, I think the mustache is staying until the beard catches back up. Gotcha. With it. Yeah. Uh, I I do like having the beard. I like the, I like covering my face a little bit. Uh, I feel very naked right now. <laughs> it feels very different. Like, this is, uh, yeah. It's, it's it's an odd sensation. Gotcha. Yeah. I I wish I could grow a full beard, but I can't. Like like it looks like I could. But, like, after a few weeks, people are like, dude, you got to wash your face, man. You've been, you've been eating the Oreos too fast. I, I'm well like, it's my I can't grow a full beard either, yeah. but I take it as far as it'll go. And it's a little yeah. splotchy in places, but I it's just okay. Got the little chin thing right here. <laughs> now, I can do a mustache. I've done the, you know, the kind of the Iron oh, Sheik one before. Nice. So oh, that's nice, too. This is yeah. the longest I've ever had a mustache in my life, which is a full day. Because it feels, <laughs> it feels weird. Uh, but, no, no, maybe we'll... we'll We'll see how you I never know. You might get attached to it. Did you ever watch Kids in the Hall? I have watched Kids in the Hall. Do yes. you do you recall the sketch where um uh, what the fuck's the guy's name? Is it Kevin McDonald where he grows the beard on vacation and then his wife's like, oh, time to shave the beard off and like it takes him <laughs> over. It's so fucking hilarious. Yeah. It's like I love that kind of humor. I, so I, I feel like it's possible. Like I told you, I'll, we'll see how I feel in a couple of yeah. days. Like. Mm -hmm. We'll see uh, how the, the, if I start getting matched on a whole bunch of different tinders with the mustache. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then you can go start having a bunch of same size I don't know, dates. Maybe, I, yeah. I feel like you need, you need to go through some for. things, though. Like, you need to have a, a good bowl of soup and see how you feel about that. Yeah. Like, you have to go, maybe a, a spaghetti. Um, what else is, is ice cream? cream. I, I always some have, ice cream. I always have the mustache, but usually I have the beard with it. So it's just a different type yeah, of experience. Yeah, I eating ice cream one day is yeah. why I got rid of my big, you know, <laughs> old timey, you know, old timey boxers mustache because I'm like, this is a mess right now. Like, I can't, I can't enjoy ice cream. It's it's going away. Then as soon as I shaved it off, I'm like, why did I do that? I shouldn't have gotten rid of it. Yeah. It became part of me. Maybe you should just go and get a chin tattoo. Oh. And then if you don't like it, then then it'll grow in. The beard will come. It, it'll take about two or three weeks to be back where it was. It, I told you it wasn't much of a beard to begin yeah. with. Uh, but yeah, two or three weeks, I'll be back to normal. Well, I wish you the best of luck on that. Cause, and again, I just, now see, Daryl's got a pretty good beard. You can't see Darryl's it. Daryl's got but a I, fantastic he beard. He does it. Yeah. In yeah. fact, I get confused for Daryl quite a bit. I don't know if he, he knows was saying, this. Yeah, he was saying, really? I, I, well, you know, I will everybody's go in, talking about Daryl Bean. Everybody's, yeah. everybody's always talking about Daryl Bean. No, I went to the Darryl castle Lee. the other, uh, about a week or so ago. And uh, one of the guys at the front door said, oh, I didn't even know you were going to be here tonight. Where's your equipment? And I was like, <laughs> I don't think you know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fucking great. I apologize. <laughs> It's okay. I think, no, uh, I think several of us have uh, similar said. looks. Like, I get confused for Jason Giller, and I get f confused with... Uh, uh, Charles Hill all the time. Charles that Hill one, looks yes. like because uh, he's he's much more gray than me. Mm -hmm. um, 
But when I have the full beard, Charles and I next to each other look like we're brothers. I could see, I could see like a what is it? Um, the the negative because he's he's more blonde and right. you're more brunette. Right, right, right. So yeah, yeah. In, in fact, uh, there's there's a picture of Charles I and I next has to that each other. Vest too. He might have this vest. Uh, he and I have the exact same leather jacket, and we both wore them. For oh the same Jesus show Christ! Uh, That's so, beautiful. Yes, it's fantastic. So I mean, he plays guitar. I don't play guitar. So maybe I'll have to learn how to. Or, play, or get play like a, a triangle. Or yeah. a triangle? Can just, you know, <laughs> of all can... the musical... <laughs> tri well, was, uh, if he's not musically inclined, like, anybody can fake a triangle. Right. So. You know, that... form a band. That just, mm -hmm. like, this crazy thing just popped into my head. We speaking of that. And, again, like, this is totally off subject, but there was one time I was at a bar and this band came in, mm -hmm. and a guy literally brought his box. He was playing in a box. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, just, like, you have your box in a box? And he just was sitting there, you know, like... And it was in a box. Yes. Okay. I, again, that's totally off subject. That's, I do that some. That's a real instrument. That's a, that's yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but why would you bring it in a box? Like, you don't need a box for it. You gotta protect your box. I, yeah, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what my mom that's told a, me. That's a life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a lesson for life. That can be a tagline for the. Uh, protect your box. For the. What do we call it? The uh, sin room? Yes. Yeah. That can be a tagline. The sin room. Protect your box. Uh huh. Yeah. Appreciate that. Set you up, you doctor. Absolutely. Yeah. I got you. We've got a lot of good one-liners on here. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I have a McGeeby track. Yeah. Yeah, we're probably at about like seven or eight right probably, now. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. The good old shuffleboard here. It's. Uh, I, like, I like the shuffleboard. I like how you're using it as. You know, that was actually Daryl's idea. Because we were trying to figure out one day. I'm like, yeah, I got a table upstairs. And he's like, dude, just fucking use the shuffleboard. Yeah. And like yeah. everyone's loved it. Yeah. No, it works perfectly. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's always talking about Daryl Bean. Exactly. Yeah. Can't escape it. You know, you the show up. I'll just sit in there and be like, my name is Greg Sharp. <laughs> you know? Nobody would ever just know make the difference. The, yeah, just make the camera like a little bit blurry, you know? Yeah. I'm oh. so glad you're here. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny is one time, uh, it was the first time I met uh, Jim Friday Dunsmore, uh -huh. I thought he was Jason Phylon Morris because like the J and the S. Oh yes. Oh. And I like I was like, like a... yeah, man, you know, like so how you know like I was talking to him and he's like, I don't think, and I'm like, oh fuck, but it's just confusing because he's you... him in fifteen years. There you yeah, go. and yeah. when you I see the names, see the they're connection. so yeah. uh -huh. they all have they they both have very distinctive looks. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. And, I met you before and too. Similar in energy. Yes. yes. They're both just happy and. <laughs> yep. And as well, I mentioned. Uh, Comedians Drew Harmon and Mike Cronin are very similar. I had them on a show one time, like one after another, and it was like, oh shit! Like, are people gonna like think that he just went yep. to the bathroom and came back on? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is something that is very like, interesting about booking shows. Is because when we think about like booking a diverse show, there's so many different things that we have to think about. It's not just the obvious ones that you would think of. It's exactly what you're talking about. Does this person have a different energy? than the person before them. Oh, or, absolutely, or, or, yeah. Or putting too many people that are similar on the same show, like one-liner comics, uh, which I kind of consider myself a sort of a one-liner yeah, mm -hmm, comic mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Yep. I do a lot of one-liners in, in the middle of my set. But, um, like, if I'm on the, uh, the same show as another one-liner comic, I'm not going to stand out because yep. somebody is yeah. devoting their whole set to it. Uh, so those are the types of things that I think about. It's, Absolutely. It's, it's really interesting. It's like building a show, you know? Yeah. And like one, one example that I use, and on, unfortunately a lot of people in the scene now don't know the comedian Joey Dedurian. He is so similar to former um, Michigan comedian Robert Schneider. It's like I can't ever book them on a show together. They're both equally hilarious, but like people wouldn't be able to tell who told what joke. And right. I want people to leave the show saying, hey, I you know specifically remember Greg Sharp telling this joke or... Elena telling this joke, whereas if you have people who are too similar, exactly. they, don't, they don't really get a chance to shine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. In fact, I made that exact mistake with uh, Camilla Bellario and Charles Hill, who both play guitar. Oh, yeah. I think they're the only two guitar comedians in our scene, Agreed. and I happen to have them both on the same show. And when I saw Charles come in with his guitar case, I think it might have been the first time I'd met him, I thought, oh, oh what have I done? <laughs> yeah. Does anybody, like... Like, you should have asked him, okay, do any of you play the flute or drums? Because, yeah, rock, paper, scissors. Yes, exactly. Winner gets to play so the guitar. There's, there's just so many things to think of when you're putting the yeah. show together. But, but that's part of the fun of it, right? You know, like, that's part of the challenge is, like, sitting down and building a show and trying to, again, make sure that everybody is going to shine in their own way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think, uh, I, I, I'm, sh I'm almost certain of it, that as a comedian myself, when I go to a show and I see that I'm at the top of the lineup, my first thought is like, oh, this booker doesn't think that I'm good enough to be at the end. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And now that I booked my own show, 
there's so much more that goes into it, at yeah. least in my mind, when I'm trying to put together a show. If you're at the top of my show, chances are I think you're pretty great mm -hmm. because I need the show to start strong. I yes. need to have somebody with some good energy up front who's going to get some laughs, sort of warm them up a little mm -hmm. bit if I can't. Um, so I've put people at the top of my show and seen them sort of like, oh, yeah, I'll go first. It's like, mm -hmm. that's not, I'm not trying to make a judgment about how good anybody is right. based on where they are in the lineup. I'm trying to do front to back. It's going to be, have to be a good show. So if I have somebody who's a little bit weaker in the lineup of eight comics, you might end up in the middle mm -hmm. or I'm certainly not going to put that person next to like another weak comedian. I would space them out somehow. So yeah, there was one time and I've talked about it before. I had to follow Marcus Oland. Oh, yeah. And I was like, why am I going on after fucking Marcus Oland? Mm -hmm. Of all fucking, like, yeah. you know, of course, he goes out there and crushes it. I'm like, hey, it's me, guys. <laughs> and he does all your German material. Yeah. And, just yeah. it all. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And, like, it's funny because, like, I was just, like, my heart sank. I'm like, because, he, you know, he's killing it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, now what are they going to think? I mean, I did okay, but it's like. I shouldn't have gone after Marcus. I should have gone before Marcus. Yeah, yeah you, you know, to burn your brazzers material. I've, yeah. I've had that experience recently with uh, Jordan Hansen. I don't know if you're mm. familiar with. Yeah. He's got such a unique, powerful energy on stage, and well, he's because he's, he's three times the size of a normal human he's man. A, <laughs> he's a very tall person. He's a very like animated performer, yes. and I had to follow him after he just annihilated at the Blind Pig, and I went up after him. And I just started with my very best Jordan Hansen impression just to sort of let everybody know that this is not who I am. Right, like, I am making I know it. Know what's I am, happening. I, I, I know yeah. that in order for you guys to pay attention to me, I'm going to have to transition from his energy into whatever I bring, which is not the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I got more laughs from the Jordan Hansen impression than I got from my own material. <laughs> right. But at least from my own perspective, it was like, okay, well, I at least tried yes. to to follow somebody who I knew was going to like take a lot of the energy mm -hmm. and keep it for himself. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. He's just, if anybody who doesn't know Jordan Hansen, he's one of my very favorite he's comedians. He's fantastic. And he's new to the Michigan scene and he's new to Lansing, mm -hmm. but he fits in so well with the weird Lansing energy up there. I don't know how he ended up there, but it's absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. And he's just one of the most talented performers they, in our scene right now. And I don't think people even know who he is yet. They have, they have uh, taller doors. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's how he... In fact, uh, his, I think his... Instagram ducking handle is doors. ducking through doors. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> six, nine, six, no. How tall? I, he says it in his set. He's yeah. a very tall person. See, yes. that's bullshit. I'm like five foot eight. We got guys out there six yep. foot nine. Like, get, give me a few inches, please. You know, I want to be able to. I know. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, can, we, can we isolate yes. that one, I'm, please? I'm please, it. yeah, sure. Zoom, <laughs> zoom it on the face, that's please. What we all want. <laughs> that's what we, yeah, that's what we all want. Desperately. Uh, actually, for the record, I would like more than a few. Thank you. Very yes. Hi, yo. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, Sorry, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorry, Mom, if you watch. I'm sorry. Um, who is one comedian around here that you may not have had on your show yet that you really want to get on? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, in fact, the, the, that question answered itself recently because Andy Beningo is going mm. to do my show in a couple of weeks. Very nice guy. And Super just, nice guy. I have not met him yet, uh, but I've heard nothing but amazing things. I've seen his dry bar special, and he's one comedian who reached out to me and said, hey, I've heard about your show. I'd love to do it. And when I got that message, it was like, oh, my God, Andy Beningo knows who I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. just the opportunity to have him on my show, uh, those are the types of experiences that make all of this yes. seem like a little bit surreal. Not that, you know, I, what is a comedian celebrity from right. Michigan right, 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 right. when you think about it? But, like, the people that we all admire... Uh, wanting to come and do my show just makes oh, it tickles it's a great me feeling. so much. Yeah. But that's a testament to what we were talking about earlier and, and just treating people not only with respect but nicely and 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 warmly. And from a from a performer's perspective, the the buzz around town about your show, every single time that someone has mentioned to me uh, that they've done your show, the, at some point in the conversation, I know they're going to say, and it was so nice. I got, I've got these cards <laughs> and like, I got my third card and it, and, 
I, I won't name the person, but they were like, they're just so nice, but I don't know what to do with it now, but I can't get rid of it, but I don't know where to put it. But for those who don't know, um, when and Greg said that everybody gets paid out of the, the tip jar, what they do is they will give you that payment with a nice handwritten note that says, thanks for doing the show. But it's not always just... You know, he didn't, 64 weeks ago, he didn't find what to write inside of a card and then print those and write them. They're all different. You know, thanks for doing show number 37. You were important. And and it's, it's the smallest thing, but it is so, I have mine on my fridge. Just <laughs> it's so touching and heartwarming. And it's little things like that 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 continue that reputation and that get out to the larger people that it's, it's a good show. Well, it's part of just, it's part of why I do the show. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I, I'll give full credit to Lisa Lyon for being the one who writes most of the cards. And it was, you know, it was her, uh, really saying we need to let people know that we're, we, we appreciate everything that you do. Look, people are coming from, I don't know, in some cases, a hundred miles away, 200 miles away, just to do 10 minutes on the show. I'm not blind to the effort that people are doing or putting in to come mm -hmm. to do the show. So I try to show them that I appreciate them as much as I can. And I, I, I really love that we are known for giving out those thank you cards. Yeah. I'm really glad that that's part of what we do um, because it is why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. The comedians in our scene deserve to be treated well. Um, Absolutely. It doesn't matter if you're running a bar show or a club. Comedians are doing a good thing mm -hmm. by trying to make people laugh. Mm -hmm. yes. And if, if it takes my little encouragement to let people know that I appreciate them, to let them know that they can keep doing it, I want them to keep doing it. Yes. It doesn't matter where you are in your comedy journey, if you're on day one or if you've been doing it for 10 years, um, we always need that little motivation mm -hmm. to go and do it again. Because... A lot of times you're just going back to another bar to do yep. whatever time you're going to do. And that's hard. It's hard to sort of convince yourself that it's worth it. And it's absolutely worth it. Yes. It's absolutely worth Every it. Every single time. Yeah. Every single time. Oh, you got anything else you want to ask Greg, Elena, before he goes back to the future? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, I can't help myself. No, I'm, I'm glad you're here, Greg. Oh, well, I'm, Same I'm, as I'm really glad you're both here. Aww. Well, I live here, so. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I'm here, too. Well, again, dude, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank um, you so much for having before me, Before we go ahead and we cut everything off, plug the hell out of your show. Any shows you've got coming up, man, uh, plug, yeah. plug, plug. Uh, my show is every single Tuesday at the Beer Grotto. That's in Dexter. It's right on Main Street. There's a lot of free parking. We don't charge admission. There are always free shows. We do a tip bucket. We collect uh, whatever you're willing to pay. And we always tell people, like, look, if you feel like you would have paid for a ticket to this show, just decide what the price of the ticket you would have paid to come see this show. And we've been able to support the show that way. We've been able to pay every comedian that's come through. Um, we've had over 250 different comedians over the span of those 64 weeks. Uh, like I mentioned, we have Andy Beningo coming up. We've got, I, I don't even remember who else we have. We have... Uh, a lineup of all women coming up uh, in the middle of November, so look for that. It's going to be an amazing. Do you guys hear show. that? That's so weird. I, like, I think I hear something. Do you hear that? That's so we weird. We almost made it. We almost <laughs> made it. I know. Almost. We might as well get in. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. You might as well cameo. Get a cameo in here. She said. She said. She said so quietly okay. over there. Yeah. So for those who, uh, this is the longest because, I've ever not, not heard. The she um. So so prior to this show, um, we heard from the peanut gallery being uh, the lovely and talented. Karakarachi, um, specifically about a podcast episode that she was doing where someone was talking from the outside and they kept saying, at least talk on the microphone. 
so it's not dead air. <laughs> and uh, and now she is screaming from the couch. Uh, it, it only not, took that one mics. thing. Yep. She just found yeah. that it was a show she wasn't on that she wanted to be on. Yes. Oh, she's more than, there is an and Kara knows shows. that she's always yes. welcome to just pop in and she yes. can always yes. have time. Uh -huh. She doesn't even have to tell me that she's coming. <laughs> uh, I've already headlined your show. You I have headlined my show. Five minutes. So for those... <laughs> Again, uh, number one thing when you're doing crowd work uh, is repeat back into the microphone what the audience member said. Uh, no, I forgot. She, she she's has, already headlined. She has headlined yes. my show. We've had some of the best comedians. Like, almost all of the top comedians in Michigan have come through and headlined the show at this point. Um, and even I hope, Kara. Even Kara. <laughs> wow! Wow! Especially, especially ah, Kara. Damn! Uh, damn! So, yeah, don't... If, you. You, if you're looking for a reason to come out and visit Dexter, especially in the fall, because we have... Uh, uh, it's out in the middle of nowhere. We have the uh, the apples that you can come pick. You can come pick apples, and there's the... Whatever you call it. <laughs> I don't what? Know. what? what? There's what lots the of reasons to come to... Come pick not, apples! There's hey. not a whole lot of reasons to come to Dexter, come but yeah. apple picking is one yeah. reason why people come to Dexter, and now there's also a comedy show on Tuesday nights. So yes. Yeah, so you can pick apples and the, I, throw them at the comedians that don't do well. Give me the ideas. <laughs> yeah. I ramble all the time. Uh, no, that's fine. Hey, I ramble um, all the time. Uh, you, you gave me the opportunity, so I'm also going to uh, promote myself. Uh, follow me on uh, Greg Sharp Comedy or wherever I'm on the social medias. I'm on Instagram and TikTok and... Look All me up. Places. Awesome. All of the places. Very good. Make sure to follow him. Elena, how about you? What do you got yes. on the calendar? Uh, at Gonzaleza, G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-E-Z-A. -E -E and uh, look for me, uh, we'll say, in the first quarter of 2023 at the Comedy Experiment uh, on a Tuesday night when I actually get a sitter. And, uh, and, and yeah, but follow me on the socials. Sounds very good. And as for me, um, it's... I'm so like stupid when it comes to social media. We have an Instagram sitting down with stand-ups uh, 313. Is that right, Daryl? Yep. Yeah, I showed you how fucking involved I am with technology. <laughs> but um, this will probably air after November 5th at Bearded Lamb. But I'm still going to say it. I've got Lena Gonzalez and Greg Sharp going to be on the Bearded Lamb show on Saturday day, November 5th. Then I've got December 3rd at the Rusted Curl, Bill Bichard and Tyler oh, Nissen. Oh. Uh, December 10th, back at Bearded Lamb, Bill Bouchard again with Sam Rager. And then January 14th, Bearded Lamb, Cam Rowe, and Kate Brindle. So we got a lot of great nice. shows coming up. Those are great yes. shows. Nice. Wow, good. Stacked really as good hell. Stuff. So, again, thank you all so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Yeah.